G'day viewers, my name is Oren Thomas. I'm a principal cloud, hybrid cloud advocate at Microsoft and joining me today is... Hey everyone, I'm Sonia Gov. I do cloud stuff too. <laughs> okay, and today we are going to talk about, actually that's not what we're going to talk about, is it? Uh, that says Hi. hybrid identity. We're actually talking about file servers. <laughs> so, <laughs> finally, we, we are. Up. Um, Look, while, so while, you, while, you find, while you find the right slides, um, welcome to Learn Live. This is your chance to follow along on a Learn module on Microsoft Learn with us as your guide. So if you want that blend of um, following along the bite-sized pieces at your own pace, but you really like the comfort of being able to ask an instructor questions, um, think of us as your instructors. We will be going along explaining some of the tricky parts um, here to answer any questions you have, throw them in the chat. But as Oren said, we are going to be talking about Azure Files today. And we have Christian Vergara. I hope I pronounced that right, Christian. I didn't actually check with you after last week whether or not I completely stuffed that up. And Christian's going to be in the chat and throwing any curly questions that you've got directly at us. Okay, so this particular module, talking about hybrid file server infrastructure, about your files being on-prem and in the cloud and everywhere in between, actually sits in the AZ800 exam in the Managed Storage and File Services functional group of that exam. So if you're actually interested in this exam, guess what? We're going to be announcing the beta for this probably sometime next week. So keep your eyes on the Microsoft Learn blog because you will find out how you can actually do the beta exam for the AZ800 and the AZ801 exams. And that'll allow you to do it before everybody else and have a go at all of these questions and uh, maybe get this certification before anybody else does. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we are going to get straight into our module, implement a hybrid file server infrastructure. Okay, Sonia, how would you introduce this topic? <laughs> Um, uh, the thing I like about this particular topic and the fact that it's in those exams is it's a topic that is very familiar to most on-premises IT pros. If you think about the traditional workloads that a Windows server might do, it's serving Active Directory so people can log in. It might have been producing email if you've been running Exchange on it for emails. And the next most obvious workload before you get into applications is being a file storage system and a file share. So all of our users that have mapped Network Drive and they're saving files into a place where their team can share them. This is like file storage 101. We've been doing it forever as IT pros for our organizations. So this particular module is talking about how you can migrate that capability from your on-premises file server to Azure, but also maintain that functionality for our end users. So we still want people to be able to access those files. And we're not talking about turning off that file server in some instances. So we're having this hybrid replication between our on-prem and our cloud environments. You're nodding furiously, Oren, you like that point, don't you? This is the real essence of hybrid here. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Look, this is the gateway drug to Azure. I, this is my absolute favorite hybrid technology. And it's the one I like to talk about when I'm talking about what the value is of the cloud. File servers are the most common server workload in existence. If you look at everything that servers do all around the world, even though you've got all of these web servers, it turns out that there's a lot more file servers than there are web servers. And one of my first jobs as an IT pro in the 1990s was dealing with file servers. These were Banyan file servers, which gives you an eye, uh, you know, this shirt and the fact that I've just said Banyan should give you an idea about the age don't let the freckles fool you very old man <laughs> and but my job was mucking out a file server now what's mucking out a file server well what you know about file servers is that people go and store files on file servers and that people create files and people are creating files all the time but the, there's another part of that story 
is that once a person creates a file and they work on it and they do things, at a certain point in time, they stop using that file. That file sits there and it doesn't do anything. It just sits up there on storage. Now, you end up with a great collection of these files that are no longer being used. And there was a sort of some research done about 15, 20 years ago that found that if a file isn't touched for 90 days, the probability that it'll ever be opened again is vanishingly small. So what would happen is, especially in the old days when we were talking about megabytes instead of gigabytes or, you know, certainly what we've got file servers now, you'd end up with file shares getting completely clogged with files. And your job as the file server administrator was to mark out the file server, where you'd take or you would delete all of the files that you could so that there was going to be more space so that for the next month or two, the people in the department you worked in could go and write new files to the file share. But the challenge with that was that sometimes you'd go and remove or delete a file that someone would actually need later on. And we've all who've been in IT Pro for a while had someone come to us and say, um, Sonia, there used to be an Excel spreadsheet in this folder that had the company accounts from 2013. I can't it's find it's always an Excel spreadsheet, right? What, who runs the world? Excel. Like Excel spreadsheets run the world, they literally do. And I would like to know, if you're joining us live and you're in the chat, have you ever needed to go through your files to reduce the amount of files that are on your server because you've got that lovely alert to say that you're about to run out of disk space? I think mucking out is a very Australian term, but it's definitely a very universal problem um, you know, that, that we see across the globe. So I don't think you can escape being an IT pro without at some stage having to do a cleanup because on-prem disk is a finite resource. And usually the way I would find out that a file server needed mucking out, and mucking out, it might be an Australian term, basically, if you've got animals in a pen, they tend to fill it up with a certain type of uh, uh, biological Out matter. Output. Yeah, and <laughs> at some point you've got to pick up a shovel and deal with it. And that's sort of what <laughs> the same idea here. Okay, so let's get into, we'll talk about what technologies assist you with this in this module. So what we're going to do, the learning objectives for this module are that we're going to describe as your file services, we're going to configure as your file services, we'll configure connectivity to as your file services, we'll describe as your file sync, implement as your file sync, deploy as your file sync, we'll talk about cloud tiering, and cloud tiering is the real hint about the automatic shoveling of stuff out of the, the animal pen. And then we'll also talk about one of, uh, if I ever am presenting on Windows Server, I say, uh, who here loves DFS, Distributed File System? And no one will ever put up their hand because people oh. tolerate DFS, but I don't think anybody <laughs> really loves it. Sonia, do you love DFS? Look, uh, not particularly. I think that you know, we, we love the capability that it gives our business users. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare to manage, let's be honest. Yes, it's very much what we might call a legacy technology, which means it was really, really good when it was introduced and it offered a whole lot of promise. But it kind of comes with its own challenges. Let's just say that and move <laughs> on so okay nice sonia would you like to start describing how is your file services works yeah absolutely so azure file services is a component of azure storage so with azure storage we've got four different types of storage services and we're not talking about the difference between um, a traditional hard disk or a solid state drive here so we're talking about things like blob storage table storage queues and then files and so the storage service that you use is going to depend on what type of data you're wanting to put in the cloud so with blobs we've got unstructured files we don't need to have a particular way that the file is written or a way that the data is put we can basically chuck anything that we like 
into a blob, including things like the disks that run our virtual machines. So with table storage, we've got non-relational, semi-structured content, but we've still got them in rows of data. So we've got information in here in a table structure that our developers might use as the backend data store for some of their applications. With queues, this is where we've got temporary storage. And I don't know about you, but whenever I think of a queue, I always go back to emails because I remember troubleshooting email servers and going in and seeing that in the queue for processing, there was a significant backlog of emails that were sitting in the queues. So they hadn't yet been either sent off to the recipient server or put into the mailbox of the people who were receiving it. And so that's what queue storage does. Queue is this sort of temporary place where you want to hold something that's going to be processed and then it's going to move on. And then finally, we do have a specific type of storage which is optimized for files. So we have a files storage service for unstructured data where we're talking about it. It could be an MP4 file, it could be a spreadsheet, it doesn't matter what it is, but it is a file format. But the interesting thing about this is this locking mechanism. And so if you ever can came across an issue where you would open a file on an on-premises shared drive to say, to get an error that it's locked because somebody else is using it. Our file storage means that we can do file sharing and it can manage this multi-access into these files slightly better. Okay, and so when we're talking about what Azure Files is, it's an Azure service that provides the functionality of a file share. So it's sort of like, a file share in the cloud or a mapped network drive, except for the endpoint of the mapped network drive just happens to be in your cloud provider rather than over a VPN connection to your on-premises network or however you were doing that in the past. Now, the advantage of Azure file shares is traditionally if you're setting up a, let's say a remote file share that people are connecting to over the VPN, you still have to go and deploy the file server. And that means you need to manage the file server and the operating system of the file server and make sure that file server is patched and you need to worry about all the storage and the disks and the redundancy and the backup and the da, 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 da. I mean, yeah. the backup you still have to worry about, but all of that stuff. Well, with Azure files, you've got a serverless file share where you basically go and provision it and you've got the way of mapping it and then it turns up as a network drive and then you're not worried about how much storage is being there because it's the cloud. And we've got all of these really, really big data centers and they've got lots and lots and lots of disks in them. And that means that functionally, you've got unlimited storage. Functionally, don't go and test this by basically trying to generate as much of the library of the world and then just dumping them onto a chair to go, huh, they said unlimited storage, but I'll show you what infinite means. So um, you've got data redundancy. That is because you are not worrying about managing the file service, but we're worrying about managing the storage. What it means is that the data is stored in a redundant manner. That is if the actual physical server that's hosting one copy of the data gets blown up by an alien death ray, there are other servers in that data center that will take over and seamlessly also host copies of that that it provides encryption, the data is encrypted, so that if some the aliens with the death ray wandered into the data centre and actually started pulling out the hard drives and try and plugging it into their, their laptops, they wouldn't be able to actually mount and read the data because everything's encrypted. Access from anywhere means that you can connect to with your file shares from anywhere in the world. Now, you might be sitting there going, well, that doesn't sound like it's the most secure thing in the world, Lauren. Well, you're protecting the access to that file share. You're just not like opening it up and going, hey, I'm going to just go to browse to slash slash Azure slash files slash Oren. Instead, I'd actually have to go and authenticate before it would allow me to make that connection. And that, that connection itself would be encrypted. Uh, use the standard protocols. So you can access it using SMB. You can access it using NFS and you can access it using HTTP. You can integrate it with your existing environment, which means that you can use Active Directory permissions and Active Directory domain services positions to actually restrict access to files. It's got previous versions. 
or supports previous versions. Previous versions is where you set something up on a file share and it basically, again, when previous versions was first implemented, it actually saved administrators a lot of time. It saved administrators mm -hmm. a lot of time. Why, Sonia? Because when people went and had issues with their files or managed to delete stuff by mistake, they could just right click on the file and go back to a previous version of the document before it had their screw up in it. And it meant they didn't have to call the help desk and get the file restored from a backup. Yep. So previous versions, yeah, as Sonia said, it basically just created time snapshots of files. So that if someone screwed something up or if someone if you know there'd been file corruption, you could just right click and go show me the previous versions and you might see 10 previous versions of the files where the snapshot had been taken every three hours. You might lose three hours of work, but losing three hours of work's a lot better than losing three hundred. Oh, so yeah. uh and then you can optionally integrate them with on-prem file services. And we'll be talking a bit more about this later on. So uh, there's, there's a couple of points in here because sometimes I have conversations with people about when would I use Azure Files versus when would I use SharePoint for storing my files or OneDrive for business, right? Because OneDrive for business is quite commonly used for people saving files as a way of saving them to the cloud. But I think aside from the fact that it feels more like that Mac network drive, you know, the, the G drive that I've always had or the S drive I've always had to access the information from the marketing department or the finance team or, or whoever it is, those little key points about the support for the legacy protocols like Kerberos and the Active Directory integration and the way that we handle permissions on that, that that's really important. That's sort of key stuff that you don't get when you're using SharePoint Online or OneDrive for Business. I think that there's also, and there's something that you and I have talked about quite at length, is that the conceptual schema we have around finding files yeah. is actually quite challenging. And that even though it does seem quite archaic to talk about the nap, mapped network share, I can describe to you, and I did when I just said, you know, slash, slash, Azure, slash, Oren, blah, blah, you instantly intuitively understood where to find that file. One of the challenges with SharePoint, one of the challenges with a lot of these cloud syncing technologies is how do I find something or describe where something is to someone without hunting through my email and sharing a long complicated link? Where is the discoverability? of those files. And one of the things I've always found very interesting is that even though we can come up with more sophisticated technical solutions to a problem, sometimes that those technical solutions are far more conceptually uh, intensive, that they actually don't work. A great example of this might even be like IPv4 versus IPv6. People just conceptually can understand an IPv4 address. They can look at it and go, I kind of understand that because it kind of looks like a phone number. And then they look at an IPv6 address and they go, well, it looks like a GUID and there's no way that I can remember that. And that even though IPv6 solves a whole lot of problems, the, the human brain's not able to deal with that. And I think that, you know, again, if we're talking about OneDrive for Business, we don't think about navigating a OneDrive for Business in a shared environment it's very good if you're dealing with individual stuff but there's almost a yeah. if i've got to collaborate with people i need it's like a library is organized in a certain way and we we organize libraries using the dewey decimal system and that means that you understand where things are in each library in the world and we ultimately put books on shelves and to a certain extent the traditional file share is a shelf and books on a shelf whereas it's almost as though with the newer technologies, it becomes a bit more challenging to figure things out and they're very reliant on search. And search is great if you know what you're searching for. And it's sort of like, again, that old joke about a dictionary. The definition of a dullard is someone who goes to the dictionary and only looks for the word that they're interested in. Because when you're in a dictionary, you actually open it up and then you go, you're looking around and you're suddenly looking at other entries that are in proximity there. And suddenly you might find something just by looking that you wouldn't have found otherwise. Anyway, Sonia, mm -hmm. when you're deploying as your files, you can use a different, a variety of different storage account types. Can you talk me through the options that we've got here? 
Yeah, and look, you you come across these letters, these three letter acronyms when you're pricing up storage in the Azure pricing calculator, for example. And it, we also refer to these terms when we're talking about things like virtual machines. So they're terms that if you get familiar with, um, they'll be useful for other Azure services that you use. But it basically comes down to the redundancy of the storage and how many copies are stored of the information that we're putting into the cloud and where those copies are kept. So with a locally redundant storage, our data updates replicate across three copies within a single facility in a single region. So we've got protection against any one particular piece of server hardware failing, but if that single facility inside this region fails, then we don't have any other copies of that data anywhere else. Now, that might sound like it's a bad thing, but there are use cases when you would use this. If you need to make sure that that data is only restricted to that one particular location for compliance reasons, you might use that. Or if it's data that you don't particularly care if you're going to lose, so it might just be test or sample data that you can easily recreate. You might not need to spend the extra on getting a more redundant storage option to protect that data because it's not the kind of data that really needs protecting. So that, that's kind of our first one. So uh, other storage options, um, if we bring that screen back up again, great, include things like geo-redundant storage. So with geo-redundant storage, we've got information staying within the same region to start with. Um, sorry, I missed zone redundant storage. So with zone redundant storage, we've got three copies in separate data centers in one or two Azure regions. But if we have an entire region go down, then we don't have any redundancy to fail over outside of that region. When we're talking geo redundant, we are taking it to the next step. So we've got this data synchronization within different data centers within the same region, but then we're actually replicating this information to a secondary region. And Microsoft defines the pairing between the different regions to ensure that the data is in the same geographical area. So I might put information in, and this, these are just made up examples. I might put information in the Australia East region and its pair might be the Australia Southeast region. So I'm automatically getting storage that is replicating from the Australia East to the Australian Southeast. If I lose the Australian East region, I've still got my automatic redundant copy in the Southeast region. But it, again, because it is a geographical boundary of Australia, my data isn't leaving my country. So if that is um, a requirement that you have for compliance reasons, that's an option. And the next thing that we've got is read access geographically redundant storage. So with read access geographically redundant storage. The information is going to synchronize across two regions. And remember, we've already got three copies per region, but the copies in the secondary region are readable. And when I first read this in the Learn module, I went, of course they'd have to be readable. Like if it's a second copy and it's not readable, how would it even work? But the subtlety in here is the fact that in an active replication mode with those other options where we've got copies of data in other places, that data in essence stays silent and you're not able to access it until the primary area where you're storing your files has a failure. And then those other copies come to light. With this other option though, where those other copies are readable, what that means is that you can actually have an active read-only version of your data that is being kept up to date from your master site and that could be useful for people in other parts of the world to access or other locations or you might point another application at that data if it only needs read-only access to that data so and it also means a faster time to recover and so if you have an application that is built that uses this data store if there's an issue with the data storage in the primary region you may be able to give your business functionality to use that application in read-only mode because it's accessing that other 
copy of your storage until your primary area comes back online. So it's worth knowing the different capabilities that you have for storage redundancy and know that the more complicated the capability, obviously the price is going to be different, but it's about picking and choosing the right level of redundancy of that data based on the use case for the information that you've got. Now, it's important to recognize and obviously you you will if you think about this for a moment that there is a difference between the data being redundant and the data being backed up so yes. this will protect you against failures of the storage medium i mean this is sort of like raid with data centers if we're going to be particularly blunt about it but what you need to do is you still need to make sure that you're backing this data up because if there's, let's say that you introduce corruption into a file or file corruption yeah. occurs and you don't pick it up, it could be that all previous versions of that file are somehow corrupted and then when you go to open it, you're like, oh, this is no good. So then you need to go to your backup. So you will still need to maintain your backups. All we're doing, this is an availability thing. Um rather than a, uh, a a data protection thing. So just remember, and if someone okay. came and deleted it or someone accidentally went and did that, that's not going to go and protect you. So that's that a completely, <laughs> completely something different. Okay, so we support two different types of storage tiers, premium and standard. Now, the easiest way to think about this is premium is solid state drives or NVMe. They're only available in the file storage type of storage account. They provide really high performance and low latency, and they're only available for locally redundant storage. So when you choose premium, you're gonna be limited in that sort of availability option. Whereas standard is, we're gonna say it's spinning rust, um, or traditional magnetic media. I prefer spinning rust because it makes it sound a lot cooler, and we've been calling it using it. <laughs> Have you, you know, know that that's cool. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's, it is what it is, right? Uh, and But then you can go and use that for everything. Now, why would you want to use premium? Well, here's an example. If you've got virtual machines that are all running in the cloud and they need to, let's say you want to go and put a database on a disk in the cloud or you want to use put a database on an Azure file share in the cloud and use that for sort of shared storage in a clustered environment or something like that. You want to have premium because you don't want your latency or your, you don't want your bottleneck to actually be the storage in the cloud. Now, pretty much the way that most of us use file servers, it won't be that if you're connecting to it from, let's say, connecting from Melbourne to Brisbane or from Brisbane to New York, that you're going to be worried about premium storage because you're your bottleneck's not going to be the right speed. The bottleneck's going yeah. to be the connection from A to B. So keep that in mind. Whether or not you choose premium or standard is really going to depend on how close the workload is to where the storage is. If they're basically in the same data center, and that's pretty much only going to be where you've got VMs that need to access this file share, and that's actually a really good utilization of them for VMs, in running in Azure IaaS VMs, then premium is absolutely something that you should think about. But other than that, don't be like my son who sees the word premium and thinks I need that because I need premium everything. When you don't, you'll be completely fine with the standard, you know, uh, red spot special option. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about, Sonia, some common uses of Azure files. Absolutely. And so the first thing that we talk about here is replacing or supplementing on-premises file servers. So where we have servers that are aging, ones that need replacing, Azure files can replace or give us extra capabilities and, and help boost to the different storage areas that we've got. And that includes things like some of the network attached storage devices that we might have. So a lot of those are sort of getting on in years in terms of technology. And NAS devices can be, you know, particularly expensive to replace considering how much disk technology has improved these days. So you might look at using Azure files for that um, kind of area to replace those workloads. That's a good start. Um, we've also got lift and shift. And so we talk about using it as a temporary place to put files for applications that expect a file share to be there. So maybe we're doing that as a short-term thing until that application gets refactored. 
Backups and disaster recovery is interesting about using Azure File Shares and storage for our backups or as a disaster recovery scenario. So you can actually use Azure Files for sharing copies of your backup files, for example. And then Azure File Sync, we get a little bit more in detail on this module, which is really cool, about actually replicating files from Windows Server into Azure Files, caching data um, at the place where it's used. And uh, Azure Files Sync, I'm gonna let you take over and, and talk about this next part, because I think this is sort of one of the shining lights of capabilities. It's easier to imagine it being extra file storage in the cloud that is more compatible with some of my older applications, but it really shines when we get to talk about Azure File Sync, doesn't it, Oren? Absolutely. So Azure File Sync, rather than sort of being a replacement technology where you're taking your existing file server and you're replacing it with a new file server that just happens to be running in the cloud, what happens with Azure File Sync is it transparently plugs in to what you've already got. So if everybody's used to going to slash slash arts slash philosophy slash uh, philosophy 101 to go and search things, that's because there's a philosophy files or a shared philosophy file share that exists on that file server. And one of the challenges with any sort of migration of technology is how do I get people to actually use the new thing rather than the old thing? Well, it's even better if you can do like you see in certain areas of town or in your city that have got old buildings where what they do is they keep the, the, the old front end of the building and it looks like the classic 1870s uh, front of the building and then they completely modernise the back end. And that's sort of, at a very high level, one of the things that your file sync does. Because what it does is instead of all your files being kept on the file server, you sort of plug in Azure at the file server level so that the front end still looks like a file server, but the back end is basically then taking those files and replicating them up to the cloud and then replicating them to other endpoints. But importantly, from the end user's perspective, nothing has changed. They're still accessing files in exactly the same way. So as we go through this module, we'll be talking about this a lot more. But this is my favorite sort of hybrid technology because yeah. you're not asking a user to con change their conceptual schema about how they're going to interact with something. You're not saying, well, we'll have to go through and retrain. What you're basically doing is you're saying, use the same API, use the same way of doing it as you were doing it before. And what we're doing is we're just making it more efficient in the on the backside. And you're not worrying about it. You're not seeing it. We're just making it better for you. And I like the fact that this also applies to Windows servers that might themselves be VMs in the cloud. I mean, we talk about disk being finite in an on-premises server and Azure File Sync is, is certainly helpful here. But when you configure a virtual machine in Azure running Windows Server, you specify how much disk you're going to allocate to that VM as well. So from that perspective, from the sizing your virtual machine, your disk is also a finite resource unless you go through the hassle of resizing it to be bigger. So again, Azure File Sync with the things that you were talking about, we'll get into with the way that it manages files and disks Sizes, you can use that for VMs that you've got on the cloud as well. Now, another part that's really important to sort of understand with this is this idea that these are complementary rather than exclusionary technologies. That is that you can have Azure files and Azure file sync working together. So you can literally have your on-prem file servers as front ends for an Azure file share but that you can also have an Azure file share directly accessible to clients that want to connect to it directly over the internet. So it might be that in big branch offices, you've got an on-prem file server and everybody who's working in that office is interacting directly with that file server. But if you've got someone remote, you don't go and put a file server in for them. You just point them at the Azure file share at the end. And they're all accessing the same data. It's just that they're, they're hitting different tentacles of the octopus. So there are three different authentication methods that you can configure for the Azure files themselves. Sonia, do you want to walk, walk through this? Sure. So 
At the start, we've got identity-based authentication over SMB. So the same sign-on experience as you would get when you are signing in and accessing files on an on-premises file share. The cool thing about it is it does support that traditional Kerberos authentication and the user identities are either in Azure Active Directory or they're in your traditional Active Directory domain services. So that's just your standard username and password that you might be used to. Next thing is an access key. So access keys have been around a long time and a storage account in Azure actually does have two access keys that can be used when making these requests to the storage accounts. But the challenge with those is that they provide full access to the Azure files. And so we don't have any way of producing an access key that has a lower level of access or only has access to some files or not others or read only access to these ones and full control access to these ones. So the access key, the level of control it has is full access to everything that's sitting in that storage account. So you've got to be careful um, where you use those. The other option is a shared access signature. So this is a dynamically generated URI and a URI, a uniform resource identifier. It's kind of like a URL for a website or a, or a GUID, a, a global unique ID. So this uniform resource identifier, it's based on your storage account access key um, and gives us access to Azure files, but it does mean that we can put some restrictions on these shared access signatures so we can set the permissions are allowed we can put start times and expiry times on when this has worked we can restrict what IP addresses are allowed to access it using the SAS and what protocols are allowed to use as well so again something probably more that your developers are going to use but worth knowing that that is a good way for applications to get a more granular level of access to data including where that data is being accessed from and the reason that all of these different options are going to be provided is that there are a lot of applications that are around that have been around for a long time. And there's a lot of ways, creative ways that developers have had to actually write and store data. Some go and access it or put it on a database. Some just go and use it and drop data on a file share. And they might have used a, a, an Active Directory account to do it, or they might have used another method to do it. So what it's important to do is it's important to be able to to do it the new way as well as the old way just so that you're not ending up with this blocker where you can't go and use a technology because the new technology only supports the new way of doing things because ultimately one of the things that we've got further and further and further we talk about technical debt i'm not sure that that's necessarily the right way to think about it but we've got applications that it's going to cost too much to go and rewrite that we are going to keep in production for a long time that do things a certain way but this allows us to as i said sort of you know put a new back end while keeping the original front end and the original front end it looks like it's a building from 1870 the back end it looks like it's a building from 2020. so that's really where a lot of these technologies go it's about integrating in a way that's conversant with the existing technology rather than you requiring you to pick up something and completely do it a new way because you know that if you completely have to do it a new way in 2021 guess what you're going to have to do in 2026? You're going to have to do it the new, new way. And then in 30, 2031, you're going to have to do it the new, new, new way. So we are reaching a level more of maturity where we're understanding, oh, actually, you know what? We can use the old way as a sort of an API to do it the new way. And it's a bit messy, but it does it. Okay. So in terms of using identity-based authentication, you can use identity-based authentication on Azure storage accounts. However, before you do this, you must first set up a domain environment. Well, one would hope that you had a domain environment. But Sonia and I actually talked a little bit about this in our last Learn My module, which was eminently entertaining. And if you haven't watched it, I suggest you go back and watch that one. Sonia, do you want to talk a bit more about this? Oh, that, that the previous module, that was the hybrid identity one. Yeah, that was a fun session. Um, no, it, like you said, you need a domain because the domain, in essence, is where the identities are stored that are going to get access into those Azure files. So you might already have it set up on-prem with 
Active Directory or you might be using Azure Active Directory and it's not really much more complicated than that except it is an or scenario not an and scenario so we are looking at having one of these identity providers um, being the way that those Azure files shares are accessed and the way that the credentials are done so when a user tries to access the data in Azure files the request is sent through to the identity provider whether it's Active Directory Domain Services um, or Azure Active Directory Domain Services, they go and do the authentication and prove that it is a valid user. And then Azure AD returns a Kerberos token, which then sends the request, including that token to the Azure File Share to say, yes, Azure File Share, we are good to go. So the only difference being that which of those identity providers is going to give the token that is then going to be handed over to Azure File Share, which is like your golden ticket to say, yes, you can go ahead and open those files. Don't say golden ticket with Kerber. I should give people um, connections. <laughs> okay, so in terms of configuring your Azure file share permissions, well, you can, if you've got identity based authentication, you can use role based access control within Azure to control access to Azure file shares. You've got the storage file data SMB share contributor role. And users in this role have read, write, and delete access to file shares over SMB. The storage file data SMB share elevated contributor. Now, that doesn't mean that they're walking around on platform shoes. What it does mean is that these users have read, write, delete, and modify NTFS permission access in storage file shares over SMB. So they've got full control permissions over the Azure file share. And then you've got the storage file data SMB share reader. And that means that they've got read access only you can also go and create custom roles but as is always a recommendation really figure out if what you can be done or what you need to do can be done with the default roles before you start spinning up your own custom roles because all you'll do is create confusion in the next person that comes along who has no idea what your custom roles are so just elevated contributor is an interesting role name that we don't often see in Azure. And it's because when you think about a true contributor role in Azure, it's normally someone who has access to modify, delete, whatever with the resource, but they don't have permission to change the permissions to that resource. So they can't go along and grant somebody else contributor access to the resource because they can't control the security at that level. But because we're talking about files here and the files actually have permissions on them, which are these NTFS permissions at a file level on whether or not you've got access to read, write, delete the particular file, this elevated contributor means that you can have the authority to maintain the permissions on the file and change those file permissions, but that doesn't give you owner level from a proper pure RBAC perspective. You are not able to then go and add somebody else as an owner to the storage account, for example. So it's kind of, it's giving you access to permissions that are permissions related to the file, not the ability to change permissions related to the Azure resource, which is the storage account. And um, it's kind of funny with NTFS permissions because I've always felt that share permissions and NTFS permissions is something that we've been learning about for 25 years that, that are still something that we don't entirely understand. Sort of a bit like <laughs> IPv6. But um, that uh, it is something that is, is a bit of a challenge. I'm much more in favour of sort of when you're actually dealing with files and folders using some sort of um, identity uh, sorry, not, not identity protection, that's the wrong technology. Um, uh, information protection solution, where sure. you've actually, you, 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 you're actually setting the permissions within the file itself, because at least then, if someone's got access to it, they've still got to authenticate inside the file to actually get access to something. Because we've all been in the situation where we've been surfing a file share and we've got access to something that we shouldn't have access to because no one's got any idea of how to go and configure the permissions. But speaking of things that you shouldn't have access to, all of the data that's stored in an Azure storage account 
which includes the data on Azure file shares, is encrypted at rest. And when we're talking about encrypted at rest, it means that it's when it's sitting on the hard disk, it's actually encrypted on the hard disk. So that if someone in Mission Impossible's their way into an Azure data center like Thomas Maron, like Mission, Impossible, Mission Impossible's his way into that fridge and steals his Adora's cakes, um, basically if they pull the hard drive, they're not going to be able to plug it into something else and access the data because it'll all be encrypted. Now, by default, all Azure storage accounts have encryption in transit enabled. This means that when it's transferred from Azure, from the, the drive to wherever you are, it's also going to be encrypted. So it's not like, again, I remember the first time I saw someone do this, a packet capture where they were copying something off a file server and we were watching the contents of the file go over the wire and go, wow, that's insecure. I mean, granted, it was 1999, but um, that this is going to mean that all you're going to see if you're, you're, you're looking at it going across the wire, and in this case, we're talking about it going across the entire internet, even if you're capturing every one of those packets, you're not going to be able to read them because they're all encrypted and you won't have the keys. So... Creating as your file shares, fairly straightforward. What you do is in the Azure portal, you select the appropriate storage account. In the navigation pane under file surface, you create a file share. In the details pane on the toolbar, add file share. In the new file share blade, enter the desired name and quota values and then select create. You'll see us do some of this in the demonstration when we set up as your file sync. Okay, now in terms of configuring connectivity to Azure files. Azure Storage, which includes Azure files, provides a layered security model. Do you want to talk about this, Sonia? Yeah, and so if you bring that screen up again, it's it's basically just the way that we configure these networks and these firewalls and these virtual networks. So where this request is coming from, our storage account firewall is going to by default allow access from all of our networks. But we might want to modify that down to this very granular level, specific IP addresses, ranges of IP addresses, or even from only particular subnets in our Azure virtual network. Um, and that really is the key of it, is about configuring these networks. So in addition to the public default public endpoint it's talking about here, Azure Files gives you the option to have one or more private endpoints. So your private endpoints can only be accessible within your Azure virtual network. That's really good if you've got data that you want to um, put somewhere and you want your Azure virtual machines or any other of your Azure services to access that data. And then the only way that people can really get access to that data is through that application or through that other server. So you don't want anybody else to be able to directly come in to that Azure file share. You only want the resources that are within that other Azure virtual network to be able to access that data privately. And that's how people will, will come in and get into it. So it's really interesting just kind of seeing how we can segment meant off these different um, network segments to restrict how access is done to our Azure files. And if you want to think about it in an even more complex sort of level, if you're sitting there thinking, okay, this is great. You've told me how I can restrict access to it within Azure, but what if I'm out on the internet or what if I'm in my on-prem location? Well, you can have VPNs into private networks. You can have express yep. routes into private networks, and then you can have express route access to private endpoints. So there are a whole lot of different ways that you can actually really restrict access to this, just as you would restrict access traditionally by having a file share that was only accessible via a VPN, like there are file shares that we can access at Microsoft that we can only access over the VPN. Um, you can do exactly the same thing to a file share hosting into Azure. And that, that's kind of comes from, you know, people ask whether the cloud is secure and they're less now, but a lot of organizations that were going on about how can I trust my files in the cloud, who has access to them? And a lot of the answer to that question is kind of, it's as secure as you configure it, right? Because if you're going to go and configure that um, access is allowed from anywhere, then guess what? Access is going to be allowed from anywhere. So you've got to understand what the options are and how to configure the stuff to meet your security requirements before you can sign a kind of 
answer the question of whether it's secure or not. It's as secure as you are going to configure it. And it's like, you know, the great philosopher Shrek said, it's it's like an onion, right? It's got, <laughs> yes, got layers. It's donkey. layers, donkey. Um, <laughs> and the, your layers are that even if you've got it open to everybody and their dog in the world, you can mediate access based on identity. But you can then turn on... Okay, we're going to do identity, but we're also going to do network location Networking. as another Absolutely. way of onioning that uh, that that way of that security. So, again, the reality is that people sit there and worry a lot about security, but then they don't put any security on anything at all. So, again, the existential threat of security is often a lot different to the practical steps that are taken to implement security okay mm -hmm. so connecting to an azure file share to use an azure file share with windows you must either mount it which means assigning a drive loader and a mount point path or access it through its unc path slash slash the unc path includes the azure storage account name domain suffix so here we're seeing storage one dot file dot core dot windows dot net slash share one if user authentication is enabled for the storage account and you're connecting to a file share from a domain joined Windows device, you don't need to manually provide any credentials. Now, one of the things that's really cool about setting this up, and I know when I use Azure file shares to share stuff with different members of my team, if we need videos or something like that, sometimes it's easier to just go and throw up an Azure file share and go, drop it over on that. And everybody can use it except for Pierre that for some reason has some port blocked in Pierre land that doesn't allow Pierre to connect to stuff. Uh, but you click connect and what you get is you get the ability to run a PowerShell script. And all the PowerShell script does is goes map network drive. So you can do it that way or you can do it through the map network drive dialog box. And it's not just for Windows. You can see here that we've got the option of mapping to Linux and Mac OS as well. And if you select all of these, you will get the appropriate script that can be run. So you might say, okay, we've got this as your file share. I'm going to put this in my logon script or my startup script. And uh, this will automatically, and it'll automatically then reconnect. And usually it will go over TCP port 445, assuming that it's available and it will perform a check. So, so can I can I can I do that with net use? Because I don't know how many times as an IT pro I type a net use star space slash slash, you know, pro name to map a network driver. Is this still gonna work if I run my net use command in my DOS prompt? Yes, it is. There is a net Yay. use version of this. So you can go <laughs> as old school as you want, Scuffy, because I love it. Nick, actually, just gotta make sure that you type in the right stuff in, but uh, it actually yeah, yeah. does work. So um, but um, it, 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 look, it's an easy way of doing it. And again, one of the ways I've, I've done this, sometimes instead of sitting up a SharePoint site and sitting there, especially when you're working with a group of people that are outside the organization, it's just like, here's the Azure file share, run this script, go and drop it over there. Bang. And <laughs> I know there's a million different, um, you know, third party sites and things like that. But sometimes you're just like, okay, I don't want to go and teach people to go and use, you know, uh, file sharing solution of the day dot because you don't know where the files are and everything like that. So this is going to provide you with at least one option. Okay, so the next one, tell me about as you a file share snapshot, Sonia. Ooh, so. If you've got a Windows Server background, you might be used to shadow copies of a volume. So basically, the the state of the files on that disk at any point in time. And that is what is used for that previous versions that we talked about. Because previous versions have been around for our on-prem Windows Server for a number of times, you know, for a number of years. So Azure File Share snapshots are pretty much the equivalent of that, where we've got a file share snapshot as being this one point in time read only copy of the data in these Azure file shares. And you can go and create these. You can then restore individual files. Um, it's basically like a, a snapshot backup. A couple of little things that worth noting, like 
the uh, you can only have up to 200 of these per share but that's actually quite a lot um, but it is really good to I mean, you know standard case if I was going to make a significant bunch of changes move some stuff install a Windows update whatever IT Pro 101 is take a backup <laughs> and so if anything does go wonky I can always get it back to the state that I had it in but the cool part about those snapshots is the ability that I don't have to restore the entire file share if I want to go back to that state I can actually just go into that snapshot and get particular files back that I need as well and to go back to you know our great philosopher Shrek it's about you know it's, it, there's layers and there's layers of data protection and one of these yeah. layers of data protection is that you go back to see if there's a snapshot that you can restore from why because that's quick and yep. then if that doesn't work that's when you go to the backups and you've got as your backup and then you can go and recover there and that will give you a lot more time but this is your first port of call and what you want to do is you want to have multiple layers donkey of protection that allow you to actually get back to where you are if something goes completely as the british would say pear-shaped okay let's get into some azure file sync so Azure File Syncs allows you, as I said, to cache Azure file shares on an on-prem Windows Server file share. Now, the way that this is phrased, it sounds like, well, you start with the Azure file share and you're going to cache it on-prem. But the way that you can actually set it up, and you'll see this when we do it, is you point to an existing location on a disk which hosts a file share, and it'll start replicating that content up to the cloud so what it'll do is it'll populate you can do it where you say hey i've got this as your file share it's got all of this cool stuff in it i want an endpoint on prem or you can start from the i've got this endpoint on prem i want this to become an azure file share i'm going to plug it into that and then it's going to replicate all of the stuff from the you know the fascia at the front here all the stuff at the front the rest of the building is going to replicate up to the cloud and that way I'm populating these your file share. So I don't think that this is only going to be, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to take a backup of everything on prem and then restore it in, in Azure. No, you do not. You can basically turn this on. So in terms of the terminology, you've got a storage account, the storage sync service, and the storage sync service is responsible for taking what is actually within the sync group and managing the replication of that. So here we can see we've got D colon backslash accounting, and that is going up and replicating to this through the storage sync service to an Azure file share or D colon backslash sales in the sales sync group, which is a different thing. Now you can add service to a sync group. And when you add service to a sync group, they basically have a copy or a replica of that endpoint. So Here's the, uh, a little bit of a description of the various different parts, but the important things to understand. The sync service is a resource for file sync. You create a sync service, and then within the sync service, you create sync groups. A sync group is for a set of files. So an endpoint with a sync group, think of it this way. You go, right, an endpoint, so a file share on a local disk is just something like e colon backslash accounting. And then you go and create that and you share it. So when you're creating a sync group, you've got all of the files that under, exist under that share. And so you're, you, you say, right, I want to replicate e colon backslash accounting up using the storage sync service to an Azure file share. But then I want a replica of e colon backslash accounting on this server over here. So I add another server registered server and then create an endpoint on that server and then it'll replicate from e colon backslash accounting here to wherever i point it to and it doesn't have to be e colon backslash accounting though i suggest for sanity's sake that you do kind of keep <laughs> the, same, uh, the same way of thinking about it on different server endpoints over here and if you're sitting there going but i don't have enough space for it remember we're going to get to cloud tiering and cloud tiering allows you to minimize the amount of space that's used the file that's sync a, that, 
That's really cool though, because it means that I can put the files that are used by the people who are using them in those locations. And not every server in my on-premises branch network needs to have a copy of that accounting share if it doesn't have accounting people in those local offices. No, I mean, that's part of what's, what's really cool about this is that you can have all of these sort of endpoints and then sit there and go, okay, I wanna have a, a copy of this endpoint this endpoint and this endpoint here. But the other thing that it does, and we'll talk about this more when we get to DFS, mm. is that there's two reasons for having multiple shares. One of them is obviously permissions, and the other one was often space, that you would have issues about space, so you would allow the philosophy department to be on this volume, the, uh, the history department to be on this volume, volume, the English department to be on that volume, so that if the English department overflowed their volume and no one could write to it it wasn't taking out the philosophy and the history department well with all of this you could probably use something like dfs and ultimately dfs namespaces is probably the best way to think about it to point at one share where it's just replicating and tiering and everything else is handled in the background and everybody's just navigating to the same location but again you figure out what works for your organization exactly. uh, a server endpoint is a specific location on a registered Windows server, such as a folder or a volume. You can add multiple server endpoints for the same Windows server computer, but they must be in different sync groups. So your sync group, one sync group might be for accounting, one might be for English, one might be for philosophy, but they can all be associated with the server endpoint. And the cloud endpoint, is the back end and the back end is the Azure file share. So that's that thing that's got the locally redundant storage or all of the other stuff where you've turned on snapshots and every all of that cool stuff is happening up here and you might not have anybody directly accessing it or accessing it all through the endpoints. But what you can do is have that backed up, it's redundant and everything. And if one of these on-prem endpoints, if someone, you know, goes into the server room and has a a, a bit of an office space moment with a baseball bat in the server, well, you can go and replace the server. Uh, and uh, when you replace the server, you just create a new endpoint and it'll all replicate down. Okay, yes. so do you want to go through some of the benefits of Azure File Sync, Sonia? Yeah, look, I think we covered those pretty well. We talked about multi-site uh, sync in terms of where you're replicating those files to. Cloud tiering is kind of my favorite though. So cloud tiering is, is this place where you can have the full file in the cloud and then it's actually going to save disk space on your on-prem server. So the way that it works is that when your disk space is literally starting to run out of space on your server endpoints. Um, you can define the percentage of free space that always has to be available on that server. And then your older files will start to not be as fully available on the server themselves because they are still fully in the cloud. But as you mentioned with that analogy about the building facade, your end users are still going to see what looks to them like the file on the on-prem server. But in the background, the cloud tiering service has sucked the meat out of that file, left it up in the cloud until someone's going to go and request it. And it will do that as a process automatically in the background to maintain an amount of available free space locally without the IT person having to do anything. And it's all seamless to the end user. If they go and request that file, it will rehydrate from the cloud. So it will come back down from that um, Azure files from the storage account back into that on-prem server and they'll be able to open it just like normal. So that, that's that's kind of one of my, my favorite things for saving this space on-prem. And then cloud backup is a scenario. So using your file sync agent to make sure that all of your server endpoints locally are synced synchronizing files up into Azure as a backup. Um, obviously with those 200 Azure file snapshots, Azure backup to do your scheduled daily backups, especially for compliance reasons, if you need to keep daily, weekly, monthly backups. And that's still a very valid thing that is needed in a lot of industries for regulation and compliance. And then disaster recovery, as you mentioned. So if you do have an issue with an on-prem server, um, it's really easy to provision a new uh, on-prem piece of hardware and then again, rehydrate it by copying 
copying back down replicas of all those files that are in the file share. So if you've got options there, we, we often have conversations, Oren, you and I, about how cloud can make on-prem better and, and knowing that some of these options aren't just do it in the cloud instead. They're like, do it in the cloud as well because of all of the extra functionality that it's going to give you for your on-prem environments. Yeah, look, as I've said to you, hybrid is really about as much or as little cloud as you need for your organization's need. But that hybrid really for traditional on-prem administrators is about how do I extend, how do I make what I've got better, not how do I replace it with something new. And this technology is really how do I make file servers better, how do I make them much more effective, rather than how do I go and replace them. I mean, you can replace it with Azure File Sync, but you don't want to necessarily retrain all of your users to go and do it that way. And if everybody's sitting in an office all the time, obviously we're not doing much of that at the moment, but in, you know, in five years time, if you're shifting huge video files around to a file server that would otherwise be chock-a-block with files every sort of six weeks, and you can have that automatically just sync up to the cloud and you don't have to worry about it, that's making your on-prem files better. One of the other things I mean, when I've been talking about to people about this, talking to our old skip manager, Donovan Brown, Donovan was sort of like, so this is kind of like OneDrive. And I said, well, it's like OneDrive, <laughs> except for OneDrive, you've got to manually decide whether or not you're keeping it on your computer or yep. you're shifting it to the cloud. You can't go in in OneDrive and go, right, automatically move anything off my computer that I haven't touched for 90 days, automatically move anything off my computer that's really, the, the oldest thing off my computer, if I suddenly hit only 30% free disk space. And then when he yeah. understood that, he's like, wow, why don't we actually have that in OneDrive? And I said, I don't know, it probably makes it a bit too complicated to do all the processing on that. But that, um, that this is one of the, the benefits of this particular technology. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to get into talking about implementing Azure File Sync. So at the very high level, you deploy the storage sync service, you go to each endpoint, each Windows server in this case, and install the Azure File Sync agent. Once you install the agent, you register the server with the storage sync service. You then create a sync group. And once you've got a sync group, you go and add server endpoint. So you're going to see us do this in the demo, but you can see here that it's giving you a lot of description in the Azure module. So obviously we've got this listed in Microsoft Docs and all of these things are done in the docs, but rather than Sonia and I with our beautiful voices reading you through all of these particular items, and you can do it using Windows Admin Center, what I th we thought we'd actually do is we'd actually show you a video-based demo. And that's gone, oh, snap, something's gone wrong. So let's just click reload there. But that's fine because I've actually got this already pre-done. Okay, so here I am on a very nicely prepared Windows Server uh, endpoint. Wait a sec. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go into the Azure console. We're going to create a storage account. So we're starting this from absolutely tier zero. And we're going to call it Learn File Sync Resource Group. It's the resource group we're going to go and put it in. We've got our subscription. We're giving the storage account a name and I'm calling it extended CAD files. Now, in terms of the location, Sonia, when I'm doing a storage account for a backend for Azure file shares, what do you reckon I should, where do we reckon I should put it? Well, you are setting this up um, to be accessed, right? And so you don't want to be putting it halfway around the world. So you want to be looking for locations. I, I, I go a couple of things. Locations that are close to where the workloads are, they're going to be accessing them, whether it's a server accessing those files or whether it's your end users. Put it in a region that's close to them and also consider your compliance requirements. If you do need to make sure that you're keeping stuff in country, you're going to obviously want to choose one of the regions that is uh, in your country if that's available.
Yeah, so absolutely. And with this, we're not going to be directly access. We're not going to have clients accessing, but this is going to be replicating with servers. So it doesn't make any sense if we were accessing these these file servers were sitting in Wagga Wagga to have it located in the United States. But let's pretend that we're all Americans and that we're actually going to be doing it in America. Now, performance, there's no need, as I said, for us to go to premium. We don't need to change it from a general, anything other than a storage account V2. And read access geo redundant storage is fine. I'm just going with accepting the defaults in this particular instance. So I click review and create. It reviews and it says, yep, Oren, I've got no problem with that. I've done the validation. I'm going to go and create the account. It submits the deployment and through the magic of television, that deployment occurs almost instantaneously. So we have our storage account. So let's go down in the storage account and create a file share. So we add a file share. In the storage account, we get the new file share dialog box. We're calling it CAD file shares. And now here I've said the quota for the entire file share is going to be one gigabyte. I could go much larger. This is only for examination purposes, but obviously most of you need a lot more than a gig sitting there on the back end. And this you need to have as big as is reasonably possible, but depending on the type of storage you're using, the amount you allocate. If you're using premium storage and you allocate a lot, you're going to be billed on the allocation, not how much of that allocation you're actually using. So here, this is just an example, one gigabyte. It goes and creates the storage file share. Great. Now, once we've done that, I'm going back and I'm going to create a new resource. I've got my, my, my original stuff and I type in Azure File Sync, and I select that, and it allows me to create an Azure File Sync service. So creating a new service in Azure, I'm gonna go and put it in the same resource group. I go and give it a, a sync name. I'm calling it the CAD Sync service, and I'm putting it all in the same location. So it's in the same resource group and the same location as that file share. I go off and create that. So that then creates a service that's gonna go and interact with all of that through the magic of television, that's all done. So the next thing we're doing now is we've got that sync service and we're gonna create a sync group. Now this sync group is going to be replicating one particular share amongst a bunch of servers. So we go through and give the sync group a name. We then ask for which storage account we wanna associate it with, bang, that one and then it'll query that storage account and say, well, which file share on that one do you want to use? Bang, the one we created. We click Create, and it goes and creates the sync group. So now what we've got is we've got the Azure storage account. We've got a file share, we've got a sync service, and we've got a sync group. So we've got all of that. So the next thing we have to do is the second part of this demo, which is unit eight, deploy as your file sync part two. So, surprise, surprise, here we are in part two. And what we're here doing is that we're now connected to a file server. So all we're doing is installing the agent. We can download the agent from the Azure console, when we're installing the agent, it asks us such as, okay, can this file server talk directly to Azure or can it, does it require a proxy? Why is it a good idea to use a proxy for a file server? Um, proxy is a good way of isolating that server from any other nasties on the internet. So it means that that server doesn't have any public facing way of, of accessing the internet without going through this intermediary. And we find that quite often with on premises environments where you've got servers that you want to keep isolated to internal workloads only, especially depending on the kind of data that you've got. So this way, those kinds of servers can still access the Azure files and take advantage of Azure file sync, even if they don't have access to the rest of the internet, unless they're going through this proxy server mechanism. 
Yep. So as Sonia said, one of the best ways of securing your servers is make sure that your servers that cannot directly talk to the internet, they've always got to go through a proxy. Just means that if an attacker gets persistence on one, they're going to find it a little more challenging to exfiltrate data. Okay. So the next thing it asks is how do you want to update this uh, agent? And you can use Microsoft Update and how often you want to check for updates. And you can say, okay, look, do it once a week. We click install, it installs the agent. Once it installs the agent, we get the wizard to go and configure the agent. So do I want to allow this app to, yep. And it goes and checks for updates and it says, okay, you're up to date. What I need you to do now is I need you to go and connect this to that thing you went and created in Azure. So here I'm saying I'm signing into the Azure public cloud. I sign in with my one of my accounts, in this case, Prime Admin at tailwindtraders.net. It will then go and query for the storage sync service and say, well, does this exist? Okay, with this subscription, with this resource group, here's a storage sync service that you can use. So I now go and register that server with the serve storage sync service. And that means that the storage server, if I click on CAD files, I've got add a server endpoint. So that is my Azure file share. That is my endpoint. And what I'm doing now is I'm, I've got that server that's registered with that sync service. I'm saying go and add the following server. And I can use this drop down to do it, which is TWT Mel FS1. So I select that. And then it says, OK, now for this particular share that you want to replicate, what's the local path on that share that you want to sync up to this as your file share that you've created? So in this case, let's pretend I've got on volume E the CAD folder. And the CAD folder is absolutely full of data and it's been functioning as the on-prem file share. So I then scroll down. I click create, it goes and creates that endpoint. Now that the endpoint's created, I wait for that endpoint to finish creating. And then I can configure the properties. So I can see if there's any files that will not sync. And now I can go and enable cloud tiering. Also, I've got the option of offline data transfer. So let's say that in, if let's say that I had a, a, a zettabyte share, I don't necessarily want to transfer a zettabyte over my internet connection. So I'd go and get the special uh, data box and shift it that way. And then I could import the data there into this as your file share. But in this case, I'm not worried about that. So I can turn on cloud tiering. And here we've got the option of how much space do you want to preserve on the volume? And we'll go with the default of 20. And then we can turn on caching. Now, what we'll say is that if a file has not been accessed in 30 days, tear it up to the cloud. That is only keep a placeholder in place, keep a full copy on the Azure file share. But other than that, if it hits 30 days, just go and do that. So whichever one of these gets hit first, the tiering will absolutely happen. So it could be that uh, someone goes and dumps a really, really, really big file there, and we suddenly have less than 20% space left. And even though there's no file that's 30 days old, every file might be at most 10 days old, it will go and pick the oldest file and shove that up and tear that. But, or it might be that uh, we have 50% free. But we have 50% free and a, a file gets to 30. And if it gets to 30 days old, it's automatically tiered up to the cloud. But if someone tries to access that file, it'll be synced back down. That recalculation will occur, but that access will count as, well, it was just accessed. So it's not going to be like you playing Pogo where I'm like, I want to bring that file down. No, it's old. I'm tearing you back up come back down again. So we click Save, and that's now set up. Now, what that will mean, if I wanted to then go and add a new server, I could then add that new server to that particular sync group, 
and then replicate e colon backslash CAD folder to a new volume on that server and exactly the same files would be there. But what's important to understand is that the caching or the, the cloud tiering is going to be for each individual endpoint. So that it might be that file A, B, C, and D are on endpoint one, but file A, B, C, and F are on file server two because they're going to manage their tiering by themselves. Okay, so back to the content. Okay, so uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about, well, we've talked about cloud tiering, migrating from DFSR to Azure File Sync. So in general, what DFSR did is replicate on-prem endpoints to one another. So you might have a set of files and folders that were on one share, and DFSR was the process of replicating them to another file server or to a group of file servers. Now, if you are using Azure File Sync, you no longer need the replication engine. What's You've got DFSR. What's the other part of DFS, Sonia? Um, sorry, you lost me. What's that one? You know the other part. Of, you've got the replication engine for DFS. Do you remember what and the other part of DFS is? The namespaces. The namespaces, exactly. So what a DFS namespace does is DFS namespaces with the part where you would access one share name and you just go slash slash share name and it would redirect you to the appropriate endpoint. So with Azure File Sync, you can use the DFS namespace to actually point you at your closest endpoint, but you can use Azure File Sync as your replication engine. Okay, so we're going to end this module with one of our favorite things, which is ye olde knowledge check. So we're gonna ask a question. Sonia and I are going to discuss it. Maybe you'll answer it in the chat, or if you're watching this on delay, maybe you'll pretend to answer it in the chat. So Sonia, David at Contoso, wants to set up Azure files. He knows he must set up a storage account first. What sort of storage should he use if he is setting up Azure files? I actually love that this is one of our more obvious questions. I think we did a great job with naming here <laughs> because with Azure files, we talked about how queues are used for things like messaging. Blobs are basically just a big area where we can stick anything we like. But for Azure files, we actually have this particular area called files. So our file storage is optimized for files. Like good job, marketing department with the naming on that one. Thank you. So we're going to go with A. Well, I mean, if it's obviously named, it might not be the marketing department because they would come up with something like, they, they wouldn't call it a file share, they'd call it file synergies or something like that. So, you know, <laughs> um, so we've got our uh, files. That's correct. Okay, let's go with the next one. When considering Azure file share permissions, what permissions does the storage file data SMB share elevated See, this doesn't sound like it was named by an engineer. Actually, maybe it does sound like it was named by an engineer. <laughs> maybe an engineer. To have. Sonia, which one of these do you like? Uh, look, if you're participating in the chat, I want to know what do you think the answer is for this one? What does our elevated contributor have um, that a normal person doesn't? Because when you think about it, have, let's look at the answers. I wouldn't expect anything with contributor name to only have read access because that just doesn't make logical sense knowing what a contributor can do in Azure across anything. So it's really between A and B and we can see that with B, B pretty much has what A has plus a little bit extra. And we did talk a little bit about controlling permissions on the files rather than having control over the storage account or anything from an Azure resource level. So let's go with B that they can control permissions to the Azure file share itself. And we go to the scoreboard and the scoreboard says that Sonia is absolutely correct and she wins a prize. Ooh. 
So final question. When implementing Azure File Sync, after registering a Windows server with the Storage Sync servers, what does an administrator need to do next? Yeah, I look when I um I first saw this in the learn module, I was trying to wrap my head around the logical progression of what we're doing here. We've installed the Azure File Sync agent already. Um, so I'm going to go with, so what have we done? We've implemented after registering the service. We've gone and registered the server already. Um, let's go with C, create a sync group. You would be correct, Sonia. So what we've done there is today we have talked about Azure File Service. We've configured Azure File Services. We've configured connectivity to Azure File Services and we've described Azure File Sync. We've implemented Azure File Sync. We've deployed Azure File Sync. We've managed cloud tiering and we've migrated from DFSR to Azure File Sync. If you want to find out more, you can go to the appropriate module. But Sonia, do you want to give a bit of a, a plug to the next session in this? Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the next module that's been covered on Learn Live is Manage Azure Updates. So actually using Azure Update Management to manage updates to your Azure VMs. And whether you've got a background uh, using WSUS, uh, got old Windows Update Services on-prem, um, this is going to be the session for you. Or whether or not you just want to learn how you can use Azure to keep those operating systems patched, especially with the latest security updates. So time there. Here, QR code, go and check out that session and register to catch all the information about what that does, how it works, and how you can set it up. And remember that we should be announcing the beta for the AZ800 and AZ801 exams yeah. early next week. So if you're interested in taking those exams, absolutely keep an eye out for those announcements. Otherwise, thank you very much, Sonia, for working with me on this. My pleasure. And thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.